like I'm 88, I'm playing tennis three times a, a week. Yup, you heard correctly. He's 88 years old and he plays tennis three times a week. But the legendary Don Sofer doesn't just play tennis in the city of Aventura. He built Aventura. Mr. Sofer was born during the Great Depression in the steel town in Pittsburgh, where he would eventually go on to develop Pittsburgh's first indoor mall in 1965. But that was just the beginning. Two years later, Don and his father Harry purchased 785 acres of swampland in South Florida, which Don was responsible for developing. He had a vision for this land, which is known today as Aventura. Don would go on to form Turnberry Associates, which owns the Fountain Blue and has developed over $7 billion worth of real estate to date, including the Aventura Mall, where this interview actually takes place. All right, enough from me. Now let's hear from the Don himself. The entrepreneurial spirit is the cornerstone of the American dream, a beacon to all willing to weave their story into the fabric of our history. I'm Elliot Dweck, and this is From the Founder. This episode has been sponsored by Adina's Jewels. So there's a day in the last century that everything changed, and that day was September 20th, 1932. Yeah. Because that's when someone very special came into this world. You talking about me? Maybe, unless I mean there were well, a lot of people born that There were a couple <laughs> others, like a guy like FDR and Napoleon, and a few <laughs> other that were in front of me. But uh, you know, I kind of I, I, I made a little bit of a mark. You definitely made somewhat of a mark. Yeah. Well, when the immigrants, the Jews or the Italian, came over from Europe. They came to America because it was the Industrial Revolution. Right. And, and America had a freedom of religion, wherein if you were in Poland or you were in Hungary, my mother's from Hungary, my father, my father's father, my grandfather was from Poland. So if you were, if your father was a butcher, you were a butcher. There was, you know, the caste system, so you had no opportunities. So they came to America because it was the land of opportunity. And of course, Pittsburgh was, you know, there was a lot of activity, a lot of employment. And it was well situated because on the river, with, they transported the coal and so forth. So when you were a kid, so you were born in the Depression in Pittsburgh. Uh, yeah, right. And that's where you grew up. Yeah. And right. originally, you went to Brandeis on a football scholarship. Yeah. What did you study? Well, Brandeis was a liberal arts school. And it was a very difficult school because I, because I, I grew up in a steel town, so I was just, you know, primed to get it to go to work in the mill. So uh, I, I never had an essay exam, and I never took a foreign language because they figured that wasn't necessary for my education. My physics professor was Leo Salar, was uh, Albert Einstein's best friend. Wow. So, and when you finished college... No, I, I nearly flunked out my first year. Because I played football, the coach went to the dean to give me another chance. Finally, he did, and of the 60 football players were brought up on free scholarships in my freshman year, 12 of us graduated. And I was one of the 12, fortunate, because we had, I had tutors coming out of my ass. So, they were, <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, that was my college experience. What, what position did you play? I was a middle linebacker. And you had a chance to go to the NFL and play on the 49ers. Yeah, but they, you know, back then it was, it wasn't like it, it is today. You know, it was, this was 1950. They, they offered me $6,500, so I decided to go in the Army, which I did for two years. How, I, how was that serving in the military? Well, it, it was because I played football, so I had special privileges. So now you serve in the military, and then afterwards you decide, I want to start my own business. Well, my, my father had started, actually, he's the one that you know, started. He bought some land out in, uh, in a suburb of Pittsburgh. He didn't have, you know, much construction experience, you know, but he knew he had a great sense of what what value was and what was important. There are things that change that you can, if you understand what's happening, you can capitalize on it. Right. It's like, uh, I mean, I can tell you, like the automobile. For example, before the war, very few people had automobiles because there's no reason. They all live close to where they were, and they walk to work. 
There was no bus transportation, no cars. After the war, the, the government came in with a GI Bill where they would finance uh, zero percent down on homes in the suburbs. So the GIs came back, they married their sweetheart, they had children, now they had to have a car. So now, initially, they would drive back to the city that were to do shopping in the stores they were familiar with. And so my father and I decided, well, why should we do that? Why don't we put the stores in the suburbs where they would have free parking instead of paying for a parking space in a garage? And so. so basically, it's just a matter of, of common sense because here they were, they had families, they were in the suburbs, they had to have a car to, to do anything. And uh, as a result, so the advent of the shopping center came about. It right. went to the suburbs, we could give them the stores and the accessibility to the places so they didn't have to go into the city. Right. One thing I did, I said, I just expanded on that because when I was 28 years old, I, I actually built the largest enclosed mall in the world. In and Pittsburgh. that was in Pittsburgh, and it's still one of the most successful. It's a two-level mall, it was very, very successful. But it was just a matter of saying, okay, they'll, they'll, they go to the suburbs, it's nice. What about in Pittsburgh when it's snowing and it's raining? They say, maybe they'd like to go in an enclosed area, a protected area. So that was very successful. So I also embellished it. I put in fishes and birds and stuff to attract the, the kids, because I know as a kid, that experience when my, my kids want to go see the birds, they want to see the ducks and all the things, so the parents followed. That was uh, Muhammad Ali, at 50. I went to Muhammad, I said to him, you know, I don't think the fight game is that. You make a lot of money for a couple of minutes in the ring. I think I want to go, go for it. He says, what, what blood type are you? I says, what's that got to do with it? He says, you're going to need plenty of it. <laughs> So when you came home, did you tell your dad, like, this is what I want to do, let's no, go? No, my dad was my partner, he was my partner. He would, he was like, he would find things to do and uh, I had to develop it. You know, like, like for this lab, this, this city of Aventura was 800 acres of swampland. So when you first purchased Turnberry yeah. for $6 million, how did you? How'd you know it was $6 million? I do my research. It sounded it sound just like my wife, she did research in my wallet. Okay. So it was Turnberry. Back in, that was back in uh, 75. Yeah, that's, a, that's a, an artist did that. What made you guys have the vision that it could be what it is today? Well, we knew, see again, it's a matter of calm, because in Pittsburgh, what happened socially after the war? The because there was such a pent up demand. If you were in the appliance business, the furniture business, the automobile business, there was a big uh, pent up demand. You couldn't buy anything during the war. So as a result, everybody made a, 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 a fairly good sum of money. They were very prosperous. So they wanted things to do. They wanted to play golf, they wanted to play tennis, they wanted to go on a boat and so forth. So, you, so I gave them a place to do that, which was here in South Florida. I did all the planning. I had Robert Trent in through the golf course. I had Hall and Goodhue were land planters out of San Francisco. Do the land planning, I rezoned it, and so forth. And then I go to the environmental guy by the name of Nathaniel Reed, and he says, you're not touching that land to get the dredging permit. Because basically, he says, that's where all the fish grow and so forth. I said, I, I can't, you know, you, you're not going to give me a dredging permit so that I can make the land a reality? He said, no. So I sat there and I said, well, there's only one thing I can do then. I have to go up and talk to the governor. I didn't know the governor from Adam. I didn't know anything. But I flew up to Tallahassee. I said, he got, I talked to one of his aides, he's going to get me five minutes with the governor. Uh, he said, I don't think I can do that. So finally, I sat outside his office for two hours. Finally, the guy said, I'll get you five minutes. So I had the model, and I explained to him, this is the project, it's, it's going to be, it's going to employ 2,000 people, and it's going to be a billion dollars, and it'll be your, your inspiration, Governor. Is it my inspiration? I said, you're the one that's inspiration for developing this. Is really? <laughs> so once I told him that, 
Then I did, he didn't even know I had my permit. I had no problem. And after building Turnberry, well, it was Aventura originally. I named it Aventura. You named Aventura. Which means adventure in, in Spanish. Spanish. Well, Turnberry at that time was the site of the uh, the British Open was held at Turnberry in Scotland. So I brought the golf in. I brought Europe in with the Turnberry in Scotland. And then I brought in the, the tennis players. I had a tennis tournament. I had the Barbara Sinatra tournament, Frank Sinatra's wife. And I had one of those tournaments was called the WCT, World Class Tennis. But I had the tennis players where they were Newcomb and Roach, Arthur Ashe, the people like that. So now, like, in building this community, how do you now attract the best tennis players in the world? Just like the best. I said, you, you, do, you, you do things that are going to appeal to the people. I want to go, you could go down to Turnberry and go to the, down to the tennis courts and see Jimmy Connors playing McEnroe. How did you get McEnroe? They're always interested in the deal. You know, the, my, my, you know, the first prize in the WCT tournament for Mar Hunt was $10,000. You know, those days, you know, today it's nothing. You can't give them ten thousand dollars for going to the bathroom, right? <laughs> so, so it's it's just a matter of, of common again common sense. If you have to be a good host to attract celebrities, in other words, uh, you know I'm pretty friendly with a lot of people from L.A. and so forth. So I would invite them all to come down. I, of course, I give them airfare. I free room, free boot, everything they had that was free. So they, they, they came, you know, and it's and they enjoyed it, and I enjoyed them, and they added, they added to the atmosphere. Right. People want to be around celebrities. They want to be around whether it's a tennis player or a baseball player or whatever. Joe DiMaggio was here all the time, and Tommy Lasorda was here all the time. Frank Sinatra and Alan King, and Richard Pryor and Flip Wilson, James Caan. So it was a wonderful environment. They come out here and see all these people, and they were just like everybody else. It wasn't like, you know, so. Right. Yeah. So you were able, by attracting the right celebrities and athletes, you were able to attract people to and live yeah, in Because people want to hang out with them. Now, did you guys know that there would be tens of thousands of condos? You knew that that generation was getting bigger and bigger and the same concept that once their friends were going to Florida, they talked about you know how well it is. I always said the best salesman for your projects are the people that live there. Right. Because they want to tell everybody what a great deal they made. Yeah. So they're bragging about it to all their friends in there, you know. So that's why it becomes a successful thing. So you have to create a lifestyle. You, you had a very smart move where you chartered yachts and you put them at Turnberry Isle to, to attract. Uh, right, right. It will create an environment. You had one particular yacht called Monkey Business. Yeah. And well, you had to bring that up. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I never met Gary Hart. Okay. And he, he tried, his lawyer chartered my boat. I knew Donna Rice. Hart and Rice had previously been together in Bimini on a boat called Monkey Business. These pictures, shot by a vacationing businessman, show a relaxed senator on the now famous yacht, Monkey Business. Eventually, you ended up building Aventura Mall. Yeah. Well, that was my main business, building malls. I had built two in Pittsburgh. So it's quite an accomplishment. But, you know, I don't get stuck on my achievements or whatever, I'm, whether that's saying I'm immodest or modest or whatever. Because basically, it's life. You do what's easy for you, what's necessary. You know, Frank Sinatra didn't have to say, oh, look, what a wonderful voice I had. It was a natural thing for him. So basically, I, you know, I'm proud of what I've done, but I'm not, you know, I don't want anybody to go around and kiss my ass because I built Aventura Mall. I'm sure along the way, there were a lot it of is, ups It and is downs. one of the most successful malls in the world today. So. That's hey, you said it, not me. <laughs> well, who else is going to say it if I don't say it? <laughs> so it is one of the most successful malls in the world. So now yeah, I said right. it too. What's, what's really amazing to me is that at 88 years old, you're still going into the office and still working. What, what keeps you motivated? Well, because I'm interested in this that I created, I've always had the 
the interest in developing in things. And now, uh, you know, I guess so when I set up a meeting with my daughter, we have to talk about how we're going to promote the ball and how we're going to get it to combat now that this COVID is pretty much going to be over. There's a lot of kids out there that are looking for inspiration. And a lot of people, especially during this tough time financially, what, what advice would you give to aspiring entrepreneurs? Are you just plugging and do things and, you know, it's... Uh... It's all it is is about you see you see something you've got a great idea but it's executing it right because they will have a great idea then you just sit on it so it's exercise but more of it is just it's just like I say common sense. Mr. Sofer, thank you so much. Okay, for your time. thank you. Thanks for sorry, sharing these sorry pearls to take of up wisdom. so much of your time. <laughs>